uh, in the monastery of Simon Lopetra on February the 4th, 1974, when he talks uh, on this specific topic of prayer. If you remember, we had a series of uh, maybe four, five, six lectures only on Nipsis. Uh, Nipsis in the Orthodox Church means um, several things. The one thing is means spiritual vigilness, spiritual watchfulness. But also in the Old Greek means the one who doesn't drink wine, which means that, uh, and I asked you this question, which is more important, Nipsis, spiritual watchfulness, or the Jesus prayer? Obviously, we cannot say the Jesus prayer, not just the Jesus prayer. We cannot do anything normal, anything normal. Um, uh, complete without having nipsy, without having this uh, spiritual um, soberness of mind, clarity of mind, focus. Why? Because uh, in anything that we do in life, we have to have uh, this clarity of mind in order to be successful in what we do, especially when it comes to the Jesus prayer, because we're talking, which uh, as we go this today, next day, I even brought uh, something uh, more heavy for us to go into. We're not going to have time to do this. But it's concerning the three forms of prayer by St. Silvan. Then we're going to see what St. Grigori Palamas talks about noetic prayer. The word noetic comes from the Greek word nous or mind, where mind doesn't mean our brain. Mind means our consciousness, our awareness, who we are as a human being. A brain is an organ of the body, like the heart, like the kidneys, the liver, and so forth. But the nipsis comes from the word nous. Uh, I'm sorry, noetic prayer comes from the word nous, which means the prayer of the mind. The whole purpose of this is to descend the mind into the heart, to unify itself, and to put it in a more simple way, to cure ourselves, to heal ourselves from what we call spiritual schizophrenia. We all have spiritual schizophrenia myself first this is uh, when when i have uh, let's say inclination i have to do my prayer all today i don't know it's seven o'clock i have to start at 7 30 uh and i feel lazy i found something interesting watching on netflix or i watched uh, something on twitter or i or someone calls me or i want to answer this email or someone from the parish does this and that and i find a distraction and justification and i rationalize that well i'll do my prayer all later and so we end up in a situation where St. Paul says, not the things that I want to do, I do. The things that I'm not supposed to do, I execute, I do. And this is called spiritual schizophrenia. How many times we find ourselves being hypocritical uh, within us. We want to do things, but we, ultimately we don't do it in the end because uh, we found something else that we prioritized uh, uh, over that. Uh, in short, the noetic prayer is the prayer of the mind that descends in the heart and becomes one. This is why when we say holiness, we don't refer only to someone who has supernatural power. Uh, because God is only supernatural. Who gives. Uh, holiness means to cure ourselves, to become whole, not to be fragmented in all kinds of delusions that we experience in life. Does this make any sense what I'm, what I'm saying? Because uh, every time when, I, when you feel you kind of uh, not understand anything, raise your hand and ask me, we can, we can talk in details. The thing is that uh, the noetic prayer is something that we're going to start talking about more and more. I'm uh, never going to talk from my personal experience because I'm a student or I'm just learning myself. But we're going to uh, learn from St. Silvan of Mount Athos, from St. Gregory Palamas, on the development of intrusive thoughts uh, and how they happen. Because we also talked, when he talked about Nipsi, about Logismi. Logismi are those thoughts who the devil uses them to attack us all the time. And I've shared with you many times that 95% of our thoughts are demonic. They're not ours. The problem is that today, a lot of people don't know this, and they believe their own thoughts, they identify with their thoughts, and they think the thoughts is me. I am the thoughts. And this is what, what the problem occurs. And then people have a lot of issues. They end up at the psychiatrist, they give them pills, they knock them out like... Uh, you know, uh, they take them like candies and, and, and their, their whole life becomes one, uh, one simple zombification. Um, what happened, you know, I was just reminded by this, I was going to share with this next Sunday, but uh, it's okay if I mention it now. You know, when I came to the United States, I was surprised by this. Uh, one of my favorite bands was Pink Floyd. And uh, I, I probably heard of the song uh, Comfortably Numb. Have you heard that song? It has a great solo by... Uh, what was the, the guitar Gilmore, player? Gilmore. Gilmore, Gilmore yeah. Gilmore. It's an amazing song. 
It's one of the most depressing songs you will ever hear, uh, but at the same time, beautiful, melancholic song, comfortably numb if you read the text. It's a devastating text. It's it's a horrible text. It's a written. It comes from the uh, the wall, the album, not from Dark Side of the Moon. The second one was a very successful album. And comfortably numb. Look at the words. Comfortably numb. Uh, and every time when I would drive the car, when I would listen to the radio, this this song will come up in those kind of uh, more popular uh, radio stations. And I said, why is this song popular? These songs were created like in the 70s, towards the end of the 70s. Why would people listen to this song? Now, when you have such a quality like Beyonce and Chicago. <laughs> but That's anyway, exactly I said, yeah. there are other, other songs. <laughs> well, the thing is that then occurred to me, you know, if you, you know, every good writer, every good artist, he creates an art which is relatable to people and makes them ask questions. So if you read a book, and at the end of the reading of the book, if you, let's say, read Agatha Christie book, and at the end of her books, there is an epilogue and says, who is the killer? So, uh, you know, if you try to read the book up until the epilogue, you try to think about maybe it was Mr. This, Mr. That, or whatever. But when you read the epilogue, everything is uh, plain and simple, and the book is boring now. And next time, I'm never going to read it again because I know who is the, the murderer, and so I don't have to read it. When you uh, watch to those Spanish soap operas, you know, Jorge talks to Rebredo and they, 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 even their thoughts are being written down. And so basically what you do is just watch the soap opera and you put your mind at easy and at rest. <coughs> you don't have to think about anything. Everything is being explained to you. That's not art. That's why it's uh, soap opera. Basically, people who work nine to, uh, to five, they get home tired, they want to have a beard, a beer, something to eat maybe, and just let their mind drift off into the soap opera and see who's going to be, you know, uh, the next uh, star in, in, in that show. Real art is one when you go to the movie theater, you watch a movie, and you walk out, it cannot be indifferent. It makes you think. It worries you. Why did this happen? When you listen to music and something in that blues note, maybe on a guitar solo or something, cranch you from within, makes you kind of, why would, why would he play like this? Why is out of order? Makes you think. And if you're a musician, if you're a guitar player yourself, you're going to try to imitate that, try to get the feeling of why he's playing the way he's playing. And when you see a picture of Picasso, for example, or Malevich, uh, he was the, he's one of my favorite uh, Ukrainian-Russian uh, painters from the 30s of the last century, he, he invented what we call minimalism in the, in the, in the art. You know, this minimalism here, for example, his picture, probably heard this, uh, you've seen probably this, if this is the, the canvas, he would have a dot here, and that's the whole picture. White canvas with a black dot. Or he would have, instead of black dot, he would have a, a cross, white canvas with a black cross in the middle, and that's it. And people ask them, why do you make these stupid uh, paintings? What is the meaning of that? He says, everything, with the invention of the photography, photography, everything is already displayed. So what I'm doing is I want to present an idea on the canvas and let people think about that. You see, Picasso was a magnificent uh, painter, but he would have deformed uh, forms and uh, faces of people. It, there was a meaning behind it, because you see a Picasso... I, this is, I'm not advertising Picasso or Malevich, by the way. This is a church. What I'm just saying, I will get to my point, Picasso does that to make you, when you see his painting, makes you think. Concerns you. Why she's deformed so much? What did he see in, in this person that he had to paint it like that? And so back to Pink Floyd, uh, you see that people like that song because they can relate to it. If we live a life which uh, we're numbed with the, with the culture, if we're numbed by the, the things that are happening around us, and we become comfortable with that state, we become comfortably numbed. And something deeply inside resonates with the title of the song. Plus, the song is great. Nobody denies that. And people like to listen. But what it basically does, it creates spiritual zombies out of us. And this is the biggest problem in the spiritual life. When you see uh, a living people or walking dead on the street, those are the St. Justin Popovich calls them 
zombies or walking dead. Zombies are, you know, a person who died and through magic, voodoo, muru, shmuru, doesn't matter, they raise him from the dead and he is able to walk. He becomes a zombie. You know how many successful movies and shows are with zombies today? The Walking Dead is one of them. Then there, I, I always hated them. I could never relate to a zombie who I think is so stupid. Doesn't make any sense, but people like to watch. Do you think that I'm more intelligent than the others? No. Maybe I was just blessed not to have that experience, but when we live outside of the church, we become zombies because once when we get alienated from the church, from the source of life, which is Christ, then we become that and our life becomes a zombie life. Yes, I have money, I have a Roth IRA, I have my 401k bank account, I have insurance, I go to work, come back, I have a wife, I have a children, but I'm comfortably numb with all of that. So in order to break away from that uh, numbness, people find escapes. What is an escape? Drugs, sex, pornography, alcohol, all kinds of things that have <coughs> that <coughs> hit a feeling of high. Have that feeling of at least for six hours I'll be drunk, I'll be buzzed, I don't have to worry about my job, I don't have to worry about it. I have this euphoria that lasts for six hours. Yes, the next day I'll be in a horrible shape, hangover and so forth. I have to uh, cure myself, but at least I will find this escape. When you take heroin, happens the same thing. And you take drugs uh, with sex, with pleasure, with all of those things. And the devil gives us to uh, give, give us to us these shortcuts, just like he gives to Adam and Eve in paradise, eat from this fruit and you will see that you're not going to die. God is not truthful when he says that the moment you eat from this fruit, you're going to die. Did they die afterwards? Of course they did. Did the serpent was lying? Of course she did. And this is why what happens to us every time we make a decision in life, we are basically committing, when we make no decision, but uh, make a mistake in life, when we make a sin, we basically are choosing the, the forbidden fruit in order, in hoping uh, that maybe this will give us some sort of uh, immortality and will deliver us from our numbness, our spiritual uh, zombification. And so, nipsis is when we achieve that state of awakening. And that's what orthodoxy is. So remember the, the movie Matrix, when Neo was plugged off, off of the machines and he suddenly saw what kind of a misery he was, that he was like billions of other people plugged into the machine. Now he couldn't even see, it hurt his eyes. For the first time when he was starting uh, breathing, his lungs hurt because he never breathed, uh, he never breathed by himself. He had to do it all over like a baby. And this was the state, what happens in the Orthodox Church when we uh, uh, enter the state of Nipsey, when we try to kind of um, develop this spiritual uh, uh, watchfulness, spiritual vigilness, in order to start to pray. Because we said many times, we pray, but we don't. What, it, what I mean by this is that uh, we usually have a transactional relationship with God. We go to God, I say, I'm going to go to church, I'm going to put $20 donation. I'm going to kiss the cross, I'm going to take Holy Communion, I'm going to say hi to people, and now on Monday or Sunday evening, I'm going to come back to my escapes, whatever that might be, alcohol, pornography, uh, whatever that might be, and live over and over again. But the transaction happens when we go to church and we expect from God in return to give us certain things, career, better, more money, uh, better health. So we think that we go to church when we... Uh, quote-unquote, pray, light a candle, whatever that might be, form of prayer. We expect something from God. Forgetting that God is a person who is also free. That's why we are created with His image and likeness. And He can say no to us. And very often He says no. Why? Because the things that we are looking for from Him are ridiculous. When I was in the seminary, we had one guy that was not supposed to happen, but someone was listening, uh, gathering intelligence about his confession. Uh, he was preparing for his confession. In his confession, he was said, Oh, Lord, I want you to give me a new car. I wanted a red with this kind of whatever, the model. And, you know, uh, when he went to the priest for confession, and, you know, he was confessing what are his... He, he basically didn't understand that uh, when you pray like this, you're committing a sin. He was forbidden to receive Holy Communion for a certain period of time because what we don't understand, uh, the devil attacks us both from the left and from the right. And this is when what, what happens to us when we uh, are asking ridiculous things from God, uh, not knowing that those things actually can harm us, can make us more um, miserable.
And so nipsis is basically that state. Noetic prayer is what comes within the nipsis. If we, uh, on the sacrificial altar of our heart, first thing we offer is the name of Jesus, then everything changes. What I mean by this, when you wake up in the morning, uh, whom do we first give honor and rightful place to sit on the throne of our heart? Christ. But many times what happens is when I wake up in the morning is the, my phone, my accounts, my YouTube videos, my whatever that might be, my, even my business, my job, my work, whatever it might be. Uh, so Nips is the Orthodox Church teaching us to reverse everything and to put Christ in first. And then we fulfill the words of, of the commandment of Christ who says, seek first for the kingdom of heaven and everything else shall be given to you. Does it make any sense what I'm telling you now? Because... Uh, this is what we're going to talk. St. Gregory Palamas talks about prayer without ceasing is ne necessary for all Christians, not only for the monks, the priests, and the bishops, or the deacons, for everyone. Uh, then we're going to have from uh, a prayer rule, and we're going, to talk, we're going to talk a lot about uh, St. Theophan, Theophan the Recluse, about prayer rule, and then his homilies on, on the Jesus prayer, only about the Jesus prayer. And he gives, these are in the form of a letter that he wrote to his spiritual children, uh, about the Jesus prayer and the warmth which accomplishes. He's going to talk about the easiest way to acquire unceasing prayer, the noetic prayer, the Jesus prayer. He's going to talk about uh, the techniques and methods uh, uh, about how do we do, do they matter, do they do, are important, not important, how important they are, should we practice them or not, when we shouldn't, and so forth. Why the Jesus prayer is stronger than the other prayers that the Jesus prayer is not a talisman. It's not something that we can use it and abuse it because the Jesus prayer itself doesn't have any magical powers. There is no magic in the Orthodox Church. God is not a magician. God is real. Doesn't, God doesn't make, perform tricks. God gives us real uh, miracles. Mechanical repetition leads to nothing. He, he will talk uh, oral and inner prayer. The difference when we say the prayer with our mouth and with our tongue and what happens inside of our heart. Is it descended into the heart or not? Then avoid visual concepts when we pray, fantasies, images, and illusions. Uh, dispel all images uh, uh, from our minds and so forth. Then, of course, when we're, the first homily we're going to talk probably will take us longer for time, but St. Theophan the Reclus is, uh, is a very important source uh, for the Jesus prayer because he's relatively uh, a new saint who uh, been through a lot and he has the profound experience of the Jesus prayer. So we're going to learn basic stuff, beginning to pray, use of the prayer books, the three simple instructions uh, about prepare, pre preparation for prayer, beginning of the prayer, developing the true prayer, and let me see, and this is not all that I have, and just the prayer rule in general uh, at the end. But uh, today, not, we don't have time to talk about this, we're going to just try to continue where we started the last time with Geron de Emilianos, and... Uh, and uh, the noetic prayer that he is talking in this, uh, the monastery of Simonopetra in <clears throat> 1974. So, if you remember, we said that uh, when we find ourselves in the divine liturgy, when we are in the state of, uh, uh, when we want to pray, many of us complain about the fact that we cannot focus. And basically, this is what watchfulness is, what uh, nipsis is, focus, being able to stay focused, on, on the Jesus prayer focused on what's happening in front of us. And we said that the best thing when we're finding in the liturgy maybe is not to pray the Jesus prayer, but rather to use, uh, to, to stay uh, locked in, into the words of the liturgy, into the hymnography of the church, into the beauty of the theology and so forth. And as the times goes by, you know, uh, if we still cannot focus, then we can start using the Jesus prayer. We can even bring a prayer rope. But that's not the, the essence, because there is no higher prayer than the divine liturgy. Divine liturgy is the Christ himself who serves. Every priest who serves the divine liturgy, every bishop who serves the liturgy, all of us who see in shiny clothes, we're nothing more, according to Elder Emilianos, but positive zeros. Okay, nobody. It is not me who serves the liturgy, it is Christ who serves the liturgy. I'm just one of you who has the blessing, the obedience to be there in the altar and prepare everything that needs to be distributed to me and to you, all of us together as a community. There is no clericalism in the Orthodox Church to somehow think that just because someone is a priest, he is above you. No, St. Paul calls all of the Christians, he calls them royal priesthood. Remember when the priest raises the lamp, he says something very important. He says, the Holy One is for the Holy. That the Holy One is Christ, the Holies 
is the people. You are the holy ones. Why? Because our God is holy, we become holy. And so uh, the mystery of the, of the divine liturgy is very important to just, let's say, not pay attention to it and uh, focus on other things. But we're human beings. We have to admit that. I go to liturgy and I get annoyed by the haircut of the person in front of me. Or I get annoyed by the t-shirt and the tattoos of that second person over there. Look at her. She's wearing a lipstick and comes to church. Her dress is too short for church. Or all kinds of thoughts are assailing us to be judgmental and lose the grace and above all lose the nipsi for prayer. And so instead of going to liturgy to pray, for us the liturgy becomes a vanity fair. Okay. If you see that happens, even in the Orthodox Church, run away. Try to find peace in your heart uh, by uh, going to that place where we can have some reverence. So, of course, that behavior in the church doesn't in any way minimize the, the effect of the grace of the, of, of the liturgy. Even if the priest is the most sinful man that exists in the world, the liturgy, because it's not served by him, but by Christ, that liturgy is legitimate. And the mysteries that are given to us are given by Christ himself, not the priest. Okay. But we'll get there uh, anyway. So what are the common or consistent effects that we can expect when properly practicing the Jesus prayer? So Bishop Emilianos, uh, whose uh, lectures I strongly recommend for you to listen. Uh, the ones are, uh, he's a bishop from Australia. He speaks with a Greek accent just like me, with a, with a Serbian accent, but... He uh, is very easy to listen to. The lectures are, are plenty of them. He has about uh, Nipsis, but he has several lectures about the Noetic prayer. And he was a spiritual son, spiritual child of Elder Emilianos of Simonopoulos. And he has the same name, Emilianos. He says, uh, so what are the common and consistent effects that we can expect when properly practicing Jesus' prayer? As Bishop Emilianos says, you can remember jokes when we pray. And during prayer, they can be extremely funny. In other words, we get this hurricane of thoughts, all kinds of them, when we pray. Exactly when we pray. Because try to close your eyes for two seconds. And immediately images and fantasies and thoughts and worries will bombard you like, like, a, like a hurricane. This is because our mind is like a wild horse. While I'm talking to you now, in the back of my mind, I can be in Walmart. I can be uh, at the edge of the universe. I can sing a song of Pink Floyd inside of me. I can have all... These are all logismi. These are all thoughts. They're not ours. None of them is ours. That's very important to understand. People today get easily confused, especially children. And instead of helping the children to ignore the thoughts, because there are methods of how to ignore the logismi, they enforce them. And if you go to a psychiatrist, the psychiatrist will rationalize. We have a dialogue. We'll teach you how to talk to the thoughts. And you're always going to lose because they come from the devil. That's the only way the devil can actually... Uh, put us into a trap and can actually seduce us or can actually lie to us, convince us about other things, and we then believe that we're something else when we're not. Then comes all kinds of thoughts, blasphemous, funny and silly, conversations, dwelling on memories from the past, all kinds of worries, fears and struggles, judgmental thoughts, anything you can imagine can come exactly when we pray. However, when we pray, even if we get all these thoughts and temptations, the prayer changes us slowly. So look at what he says. Little by little, it is better to even say the prayer mechanically than to not say it at all. And build consistency in it. That's why we call it a prayer rule. Remember, we all have a prayer rule. Sometimes we're not up to it. I don't feel like doing my prayer rule. Maybe I'm too tired. Maybe I'm... Uh, have other things that are more uh, important. But the prayer rule is called a rule because we need to do it every day, regardless of what's going on. Because when we build this consistent, then our brain that I was just telling you, once it's Walmart at the edge of the universe, and on Mars, uh, on Twitter, on emails, on conversations, and where's this? Like a wild horse, you kind of grab them and put them down. Lock in. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. He'll go again. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, enlighten my darkness. Teach me that statues. Then you repeat. You repeat every day. And not, not only on the prayer rule. That's why the Jesus prayer is so short. I can say it when I'm taking a shower. I can say it when I'm driving my car. When I sleep. 
when I fall asleep, when I wake up in the morning, when I go for a walk, when I go to work, when I talk to you, I can say the Jesus prayer. There is no excuse not to say, just say the prayer. And you will see, that's why he's saying, build consistency in it. That's why we call it <coughs> the prayer. Because the more we say it, the more the prayer becomes noetically dipped into our heart and then becomes part of us. Do you understand? We're so alienated from God that uh, the devil can do whatever he wants with us. So when we start to do the prayer rule, immediately we're basically uh, resisting. There's a point of resistance. Then the devil attacks us even more. Aha, uh -huh, you're going to pray. Let me see. What about this? What about that? Look at this shiny thing here. Look at this tangalaki over there. And what happens is the devil constantly does, especially when you pray. He uh, uh, is one... Um, Archimandrit uh, Raphael, or Father Raphael, says, when you see a family or a person who doesn't have any problem in their life, everything goes well, and we're envious of those people. Let's say they have money, they have their jobs, they have their beautiful life going on, but they don't have temptations, not at all, nothing, no sickness, no serious issues, no shortage of money or, or anything else in their life. Run as far as you can from those people, he says. There is no God in their life. Because where is God, there are temptations, there are illnesses, there are worries, there is stress, there is pain, there is suffering. Why? Because God is you with you and He loves you. And He sends us all things to us so that He can make us a better, perfect in, in His eyes. That's why without tribulation, without temptations, without trials there cannot be salvation spit blood receive holy spirit the holy father said if we don't learn how to spit blood we will never learn who is the holy spirit and so prayer can change us completely changes the way we think how we read how we behave even how we talk if you can believe even how we look externally when someone takes prayer seriously and starts to pray every morning, for example, it is possible not to change even the way we walk. These things don't come to be on purpose. It will be faking it. But when we start to really pray, this transfigures us and makes us new creations. You may pray and pray, and you might start thinking that this prayer is like a desert. It's dry, mechanical, not sincere. The thoughts that assail me are rentless, constantly whispering into my ears. I can experience hunger, thirst. You start to pray something scratching on your back. Should I scratch myself or not? Of course you scratch yourself, you're a human being, and still pray. Remember how I told you about smoking and prayer? You know how the line goes? It says, uh, one, one asks the elder, Elder, can I smoke and pray? And the elder said, absolutely no. But you asked the wrong question. Can I pray while I smoke? Yes, you can. You understand the difference? And so this is why the devil uses all these little tricks to po constantly put us into a state of confusion, to kind of takes away the peace and the nipsy from us so that we can uh, follow the whatever the shiny objects he's, he's trying to portray us. Then you find, that, uh, find out that you dipped in God's eternity because you pray nevertheless. When can read, we can read all the books on this planet, but it will never make sense until we dip into prayer and experience it ourselves. God gives us this experience to find ourselves dipped into His eternity. We get to taste what the next eternal life is like. That's what prayer is all about. There is no salvation without prayer. Prayer is what, the only way, because I've told you before, our words become alive. So uh, if I have got accustomed myself to curse all the time and I die right at this moment, this is how I die. I die with my curses. I die with my, my habitus. I die with my ethos, with my mindset. And this is who I am for the rest of my life. But imagine if you transfigure yourself to the point that everything on your mind and your lips and in your heart is the name of Jesus, the name of God, constantly you taste eternity and you just prolong to live the eternity. Actually, the kingdom of heaven starts to be opened right now. I become the citizen of the kingdom of heaven now, not when I die. 
because I don't want to be later on citizen of the kingdom. I want to be now. That's why we have how the liturgy starts. Blessed is the kingdom of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Means that here is the liturgy. Now get in. Don't wait outside of the ark. Get in. And be part of the now and never and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Without end. So we get the foretaste of the next life. So what does this mean? It means that if you die now, you will be with God. That's what it means. You're in heaven. So why not die now? Why are we afraid of death? Why are we wasting our time here? These are some of the experiences that God gives us so we can feel His presence and the future blessings that are prepared for those who want to be with God. Why is this important? When someone experiences God for the first time, he wants to die right there. And this is what we see from the experiences of the fathers and the martyrs of the church, especially from the martyrs, but those people who were killed in the most brutal way in order to, uh, you know, to deny Christ, and they still stayed focused on Christ, and even they, they gave their life. You know what they did to St. George? I was telling you before, they made him, for example, one of, he, he was tortured so much, in many cases, more, uh, uh, worse than what Christ went through. Uh, even though many saints were crucified like Christ. But in, in the case of St. George, they made him walk after he was beaten up and tortured so many times. They, even the writer of his biography says that there's certain things that they did to him that it's better for the general public not to know. We're going to skip that part. We're just going to talk about this. So one of the things he says, how they uh, uh, put him in the iron boots with needles in, underneath, hoping that while he was transferring, walking for miles like that from one city to another city when he was finally beheaded, to... Um, to hopefully he will bleed out to death, walking like that in the middle of the, the, the scorching sun. And that was one of the little things, not to mention pulling out your nails. The Romans were brutal about how they would torture people. First, uh, there was a psychological torture. They would put all the, the, the tools for, for uh, torturing. And they said, if you stay or disobedient to the emperor and not offering incense to the gods, this is what awaits you. And they will put some member of the family First to see what it, to scream and to see it. it was a horrible thing. But even then, with blood in their mouth, completely dismembered, they would still say, glory to God, I will never bow to the false idols who are demons. What kind of force, energy, can make people think, behave like this? It is the pretaste of eternity. It is what they knew what is going to wait for us? While us here, look how snowflakey we are. One virus shows up, everybody's in a panic. Everybody blames each other. Everybody accuses each other. Everybody tries to protest. About it. Against what? Do you understand what I'm talking about? And this is why, uh, because we don't have the pretaste of heaven inside of us. We never actually learn how to pray. Because if we know how to pray, prayer is a dialogue with God. Constant remembrance of God that no matter what I do in my life, I know God is here. There is no need. Where is Christ? Where is God? There is no fear. When you see a person who has anxiety, person who is stressed out, person who is afraid and paranoid, there is no God in that person. That's the problem. Because if there is God, who can be against us? What can be against us? And this is why the, the life of the experience of the saints is very important. So, uh, there, these are some of the experiences that God gives us so we can feel His presence and the future blessings that are prepared for those who want to be with the Lord. There is one interesting statement about St. Seraphim of Sarov, which uh, there is a book by him, not by him, uh, about him. There is a conversation with Motovilov, and also there is a little book, just the conversation between him and Motovilov, when Motovilov saw God because of St. Seraphim. And I'll tell you some, another example later. After having a profound spiritual experience said, if we would know what blessings God has prepared for us in paradise, even if I would be born again, uh, alive and, uh, and live and buried alive for another 70, 80 years in a tomb to be eaten by the worms, this alone would be enough to deserve the blessing of the future life. This is, this is what they saw. He found the treasure... That is so priceless, so important that he would be 
spending another life, if needed be, another 78 years of his life, being buried in the ground and eaten by the worms, just to be secure inheritor of this, this, this blessings of paradise. So in other words, he points out that once we taste God in a living experience, we forget everything if this world, in this world, and we would immerse only into the future, uh, future one that awaits us. This is why during the liturgy, when we chant the cherubic hymn, we say the following. What do we say? Let us who mystically represent the cherubim and sing the thrice holy hymn to the life-giving trinity lay aside all worldly cares that we may receive the King of all and visibly escorted by angelic hosts. Alleluia, alleluia. In that moment of the liturgy, when we sing the cherubic hymn, that's it. All of my problems, all of my issues, all of my emails, all of my bills, everything vanishes. I'll come back to it when the time is right. But now, the king of glory is coming. Now I'm focused on this. Nipsey, attention. What does the priest and the deacon say all the time? Let us attend. We're going to read the Holy Gospel. Let us attend the Holy of Holies. Let us attend. We're going to read the epistle. Constantly the church is calling us to what? Attention. That's Nipsey. So this is the time to forget every earthly, worldly thing, to give ourselves and one another and our whole life unto Christ our God. This is every small litany finishes like this. The great litany, the small litany, all. Let us uh, give ourselves to one another and our whole life unto Christ our God because there is nothing more important than Him. If you remember, uh, you know, the, the, when, when we say it in the liturgy, what the deacon says. This, uh, what we are talking here now, cannot be studied. I want you to know this. Uh, pay attention to this. Cannot be studied or learned from reading books. Yes, we are reading St. Theophan. We are reading Yelder Emilianos. We are reading uh, uh, St. Gregory Paul Amas. We're going to read many of, of the stuff. That's why we are here and we're going to continue with this series of the Noetic because there are so many things that needs to be unpacked. We are just dipping here at the very beginning. But... Uh, <clears throat> Cannot be learned by reading books. This can be truly understood only if we experience it on ourselves, if we start working on ourselves. So even if you don't have a prayer rule, make yourself one. Say to yourself, make a sacrifice. Out of 24 hours of the day, 8 hours you can sleep, 8 hours, 9 hours you can work. You still have another 6 to 8 hours to do whatever you want. You can play PlayStation, you can play games, you can go buy some groceries, clean up the house. Out of 24 hours, you can sacrifice 5 minutes of your day and you still have 23 hours and 45 minutes to do whatever you want and whatever you need. Isn't that right? 5 minutes. You can fill those 5 minutes being with God. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, glory to you. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me and enlighten my darkness. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. 5 minutes. And do this every day and you see how little bit your life will change from within. We'll talk about the experiences when what the, what happens actually when we say the Jesus prayer to know that is this a temptation from the devil or it's really the experience of the Jesus prayer because Saint Theo found the recluse will talk about the warmth of the heart, he will talk about the sweetness in the mouth, he will talk about experiences that are not of this world. Okay, and this is something that we'll get if to the point some of the holy fathers they talk about seeing the uncreated light that the apostles saw on Tabor. We have uh, witnessing. Elder Emil Nos was a witness of that light. And so, uh, this is why these are, these are important things, because these cannot be learned. We need to, we can, if we can, even if I talked here for 10 centuries, nothing I will learn, neither you will learn anything. That's why everything that we talk here, we need to put into practice. Otherwise, we'll be hypocrites. Uh, so, to able to experience God uh, eternity, as Elder Emil Nos tells us in this book we study today, this is the Church at Prayer book, for many, this will not make any sense, but uh, for the one who has experienced it, it does make plenty of sense. And this is why Elder Melios is so in, uh, important. So this is what, uh, when we happens, uh, what happens when we practice the Jesus prayer properly. And this is just one of the many experiences we can have. But we need consistency and serious dedication to practicing the prayer. Bishop Emilianos gives one very interesting example. There was a man who wanted to practice the Jesus prayer, but he would always forget to do it. He was also a very heavy smoker, so he decided to say the prayer when he smoked a cigarette. Someone asked him, what are you doing, saying the Jesus prayer only when you smoke? 
But someone else answered, what is better? Just the example I told you earlier. To smoke without God or to smoke with God? That's the question. The thing is that it doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter where we are. There is nothing that God cannot see. We might as well practice the Jesus prayer whenever we remember. And then the more we do it, the more it becomes our habit. And it will help us fight the passions. Imagine if you have the passion of gluttony. But with every bite you say the Jesus prayer. Like, ah, oh, I have a pizza over there. I would really wish to devour it. But before every bite, I say, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me and eat on me. You will see you will eat much less than actually you need. Don't you know that when we eat, if you take a pause of one minute uh, in between the meals, and if you still feel hungry, you can eat. But what usually happens, people don't know this, the signal that comes from our belly to our brain that we're full, it's always late, especially for us who are older in age. Not, I'm not talking about the kids who have great metabolism. They can burn everything. But for us, in, that's why we, get, we become fat. We have issues. Because we eat more than we actually need. But if you wait for one or two minutes, it's called so-called English eating, English supper. You wait, the signal comes, and you, oh, I'm not hungry anymore. So I don't need to finish my, my steak. I don't need to finish my cake or whatever it might be. Uh, in the same way with prayer. The thing is that it doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter where we are. There is nothing that God doesn't see. So, um, and then... The more we do the prayer, the more it becomes our habit and it will help us fight the passions. Imagine uh, uh, many other th examples like that. So, if you remember the last time we said a similar example when someone asked, I told you, even today I mentioned, can I smoke while I pray? The answer was absolutely no. But when, uh, but we should have asked the other question, can I pray while I smoke? And then the answer was, was yes. So, uh, we can, before we read the, the second talk about the native prayer that uh, I wanted to share with you, I'm going to read you just a small paragraph you know, from the book of Church at Prayer by Leo Milanos, uh, uh, from the text that is the first text, which is on prayer. So, he says, quote, Permit me, before continuing, to add something more, something further. It seems to me my fathers and brothers, remember this is a, a homily that he's giving in, in Simonopetra on Mount Athos. Women are not allowed there, so that's why he doesn't say sisters. Uh, it seems to me, fathers and brothers, that we do not really pray. If we, for if we do, we don't pray enough, he says. And even the little that we do pray is without skill, without strength, without inspiration, and above all, without spirit. Because it is only when the Spirit prays within us, this is in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, that it is possible for our prayer to rise up to heaven. Because prayer is in the Spirit. This is again John chapter 4, 24. And the Spirit comprehends Spirit and unites itself with Spirit and not with flesh. But our prayer does not have the strength and the presence of the Spirit. Instead, our souls are more often attracted by or preoccupied with other things which are of more importance to us today. And in the end, we forget that to be a monk or to be a person means to be a man at prayer. And so, I don't know how much you understand it. This is scary what he's saying here. It, just as he said at the very beginning in the, in the first paragraph when we read, he said, a person who doesn't know how to pray is good for nothing. And this is scary because many of us don't know. I find myself first. I don't know how to pray. That means I'm good for nothing. And so what, 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 what does he mean by this? He says it's very, very uh, weird, paradoxical, because we see a lot of successful people today. Great business owners. We see great athletes. We see many successful doctors, surgeons, all kinds of people who are good, the best in what they do. But he says, if you don't know how to pray, all of that means nothing. And this is how serious Elder Milnos is about this. So, the elder says here that to be a man, to be a monk in a specific case, but to be a person is to be a man at prayer. But we can easily change the word monk with human. And it will sound like this, that to be a man, a human being, means to be 
a human at prayer or someone who's praise. And we'll talk about the uh, etymology of the word prosevhi, molitva, prayer. What does it mean? Why? So a man, anthropos, human being means uh, to be someone who prays. What does it mean to be a human? Let's answer that question first. Because if we do not know what it means to be human, we don't know what we are doing. So the word anthropos, so I'll try to uh, write it down both in, uh, in, in Greek and in, uh, in English. So these are the words, anthropos, anthropos. In, in church Slavonic, we do celoviek. And I'll explain this word, actually. So, the word anthropos in Slavonic means celoviek, which comes from two words, ano, in Greek, ano, ketrosko, which is, those are the words that uh, we use in, in Greek, means I look up, I'm looking up. The same goes for Czeslovic, Czeloviek. Czelo is the metopo, or the, the forehead. Viek means eternity. So man, a human being, is someone who with his forehead is turned towards eternity. Do you understand the word? In most of the ancient languages, this is what a man means. Uh, if we go the etymology of the word. So, meaning it derives from ano, throsko, opopa, in, uh, in ancient Greek, which means the being that advances and looks forward with his forehead, both metaphorically and in a literal way. Plato, the famous philosopher, the ancient philosopher, the Greek philosopher, uh, in dialogue, in his dialogue, uh, Kratilos, attempts an etymology of the word anthropos. So Plato talked about what is the meaning of the word anthropos. And so he says, uh, monoton therion orthos, o anthropos anthropos, onomasti anathron which means of all the beasts, of all the beasts, translation, rightly, quote, rightly only man, human, was called anthropos, contemplating what he sees, anathronon apop, means he's seeing eternity, something in the future. Meaning human being is, in relation to anything else, is the only one who cannot just see but also understand what he sees. Okay, even the animals see everything around them. They can see a building, a car. I can show poetry to my cat, but will not understand it. Okay, that's the difference. So that's why anthropos means not just someone who observes, someone who, uh, who understands what he sees. This is the difference between us and the rest of the creation. Why? Because we have logos. You understand the difference? So when, when people say we come from monkeys, it's a problem for us to under, accept that, because we're not monkeys. Uh, this is the difference between us and the rest of creation, that animals and everything else, they, the animals, can also see, but they do not understand while we see and understand. Today's linguists uh, haven't arrived at a sure etymology of the word. Some even think it's pre-Hellenic, this word, meaning comes even before the, the, the Hellenic languages we know today. And the Hellenic is one of the oldest languages that we understand today with no etymology within the frame of the Greek language. The word can be found in the Mycenaean linear B writing as atoroko. So I'm not going to write all of those things to you. Most probable etymology is that it is derived from the words andros. Andros in Greek today even means a man, a, a, a male. Gineka is a woman. Andros is a man. And opsis, the look. So andros, opsis, comes to anthropos, maybe. He who has the form of a man. This can all be said with the Church Slavonic language of the word which, for man, which is celo viek. So this word celo, I'll write it again here, celo plus viek. This means eternity or century, age. This means, literally means this, uh, the, the forehead of a person or, or the face of the human being. Someone who looks at eternity. And most of the church Slavonic language, I want you to know, is basically copy-paste from the Greek language. When the, the Holy uh, Fathers, uh, Silas and Methodius, then Clement and Amo, the, the, who were translating the books from uh, Greek to, to Slavonic, they used the, the Greek language as the basis for their, for the Slavonic language. That's why they're very similar, grammatically speaking, in, in, in the syntax. So the people who lived before us, our forefathers going back to the ancient times, were on to something. So Plato, maybe he knew what he was talking about. 
than Aristotle. They had some profound understanding of life and its meaning. This is why if we don't understand the people around us, we cannot truly be human. Do you understand? If we cannot understand the people around us, we cannot truly be human. This is why we need silence to pray. C-O-P. Isihia. That's where the word hisichasm comes from. It's the, the movement of silence. Is the silence itself. And if we don't understand that, I exist for the others as well, meaning even if I have a silence, my prayers go to everyone, then I cannot reach God. Because Christ took upon himself all of humanity, all of us. Can we imagine a mother that doesn't pray for her children? Of course not. She would never like to be away from her children. The same goes for the Father and the same is for the saints who love others so much that they give the, gave themselves for others. We have many examples of this amongst the saints like St. Paisius and Porphyrius and many others that uh, we, we even mentioned today. Even though they were ascetics, they also had such love that they would accept everyone who was coming to them. They had love for everyone. I told you the example about St. Porphyrius when he ended up in the public house with prostitutes. They were blessing in Athens, house to house to house to house. And suddenly, because that every, in, in, in Orthodox country, everybody is Orthodox. You go from one house to bless the house. It's a five-minute service because you need to be to another place. So as they were going, they ended up in this strange house, kind of murky, darky, and a lot of young, dressed inappropriately young girls. And what's going on? So Elder Porphyrius started saying, started singing the troparion of, of uh, Theophany. And this older lady, she looked like a boss. She came to him and said, Get on the, you know, I please, but you're, you're not supposed to be here. I said, Why? What's wrong? And his assistant who was with him said, Get on the, we made a mistake. We're not supposed to. So what's, what's wrong with the house? Why? This is a public house. And he saw like this, and in the other room, there were a lot of shamed men who were hiding, coming there to do their business. And the other prophet says, everyone is a child of God. He started sprinkling all the prostitutes with the holy water and made everyone from over there to, to receive, to kiss the cross in the holy water. One or two, I don't know exactly, but I know I'm sure for one of the prostitutes later on repented and became a nun. So uh, what I'm trying to say is, this doesn't mean that we should go to a, a public house now and, and convert the prostitutes. <laughs> what I'm saying is that people like them, they had a dispassionate nature. This is something, what, it's also a product, if you will, a fruit of the Nipsi and fruit of the Noetic prayer to develop apathia. Not like in the Buddhistic or, or in the Buddhist or, uh, or a nihilistic way understand apathia or apathy. Apathia means to become passionless, free from the pathological obsession of the passions, and open to receive God inside of them. That's the difference. In the Orthodox Church, it's a virtue to not be sentimental, but to be spiritual, because there's a huge difference between those, those things. Okay, we'll talk about it when the time comes. So we have many examples among this, like St. Paisius and Prophetius. Even though... They were ascetic. They had uh, also such love that they would accept everyone who was coming to them. They had love for everyone. We cannot exist without other people, even if, uh, even with those who annoy us from time to time. We really exist when we exist for other people. Otherwise, our existence has no meaning. And uh, Elder Emilius also said, says, no one has become a saint without having people to annoy him. We need those people because they are put us into check. They are put us into perspective. We need to thank God to have more people who annoy us so we can humble ourselves. So first, humans, all of us, we are communal. We need to commune with each other. We need to talk to each other. We cannot exist without the others and we cannot exist without God. If we do not know how to pray, we do not really exist. We become shadows. We become comfortably numb if we don't pray emptiness we just survive and we die like biological machines which is exactly what the modern science is putting us into oh uh, you need carbs you need calories you need this and that and by the time you are 70 80 90 that's it you're done we'll close up the software is out and we'll recycle you into the ground that's it and as a comfort we'll give you a, maybe maybe you'll reincarnate as a flower or a worm or, or something you know and this is a problem 
In Serbian, we call it živurkanje. You're only living. Uh, this is what St. Justin Popovich referred to a zombification. We become zombies. I do everything. I, I buy, I, I nourish my body, I walk, I do everything that a human, a live human being, but inside I'm dead. That's why I relate to Pink Floyd. Meaning, we become dead before death. We are zombified, a biologically living dead. So, the human, to be human means that we need to be understanding of others. Not just to see others, but to understand the others. To put myself in his skin. To see what it truly, truly likes. And Paisio says, unless we develop the prayer with the pain of the heart, we will never be able to understand what prayer is all about. Means that when someone tells you, can you pray for me? Uh, on Friday I have a surgery or I have this and that happening to me. What we need to do, or I lost someone that I truly love and care about. When we pray, we need to feel like that person feels for the other person. Otherwise our prayer is hypocritical. Okay, Just like a mother would pray when her daughter or her son is sick and dying in a bed or lying in a hospital. Her heart is like a tower bell ringing towards God, pulling God from, from heavens to pull him down and help uh, with her child. That's how prayer should be like. Every prayer. Instead we say all oh, our thoughts and prayers are good for them. You know? And we hypocritically got to move on to the next topic. No, when we pray we mean to, to be in, 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 in the place of the other. And also by understanding others we also need to understand God which happens only through prayer. As you all know Christ says love thy God with everything you have and thy neighbor as ourselves. He points out to the meaning of the cross in the vertical and the horizontal aspect of our being. Remove any of them, we are only led with one of the lines and we will not have the full cross. So because it's 8, 5, and if you have any questions we're going to talk about, I will finish with this. Because then we're going to talk about uh, noesis, nisi, nipsis. We, we're not going to be able to finish this beyond 8 o'clock. But what the last thing says is that Christ says to the young man who asked him, like I think a couple of weeks ago we read about that gospel. He says, what are the greatest commandments that I need to follow? And Christ says, honor your mother and father. Don't steal. Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. Be a, a human being, in other words. Fulfill the commandments of Moses. If you see the commandments of Moses, the first four are what we call the vertical line. This. Our relationship with God. Don't uh, the first are love thy God with all your heart. Don't make carven images and idols. Don't uh, bow down to other gods and so forth. While the other six commandments, don't steal, don't commit adultery, are the horizontal line, which are relationship with us. This is us, all of us, and this is God. So what is this form? A cross. And so Christ answers to him, there are two greatest commandments. The first and most important is, love thy God with everything you have. With your heart, with your mind, with your soul, with your strength, with your physical body included. And the second one is equally important to the first one. Love thy neighbor as you love thyself. But when God gives him the first commandment, which is to love thy God with ourselves, means that we place God in everything, before everything. And, anyway. and so, without having ours crucifying our intellect on the cross, the noetic cross of our life, and our heart, and our passions, and what we cannot be even called Christians. And so what do we do? We basically, everything we put in life, we build this relationship with God in, in the same way, simultaneously build relationship with us. Since one of Mount Tato says, my brother slash my sister is my salvation. What's the point of me going to heaven if my brother is not there? That's why as Orthodox Christians, when we see other people, let's say, who struggle, maybe they're in heresy, maybe they're in, uh, uh, in passions, and drugs, and whatever, all kinds of uh, vices and so forth. We cannot, we cannot rejoice thinking that they will end up in hell. It's a tragedy for all of us. Because ultimately, as I said the last time, when we say the Jesus prayer, and Sharon asked me about this, when we say, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner, we encompass every human being from Adam to the last person who was born on this planet today. That's what? Thousands and thousands of years. Okay? Because when we pray, we all come from Adam. 
And so when I pray for me, I pray for my cousin, for my father, my grandfather, my grand-grandfather, my grand-grand-grandfather, even though I never met them. I don't even know who they are. This is how we pray. Because we are all interlinked with each other. We cannot not pray for the others. It's a different thing who we commemorate in the liturgy, meaning who we can uh, commemorate because he's baptized, not baptized. That's a different story. But in a personal prayer rule, to pray for the whole, yes. That includes praying for the soul of those people who ended up in, in hell. God will be the one who will determine at the end who's going to go where and how and so forth. But us is to pray. And so when we say the Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, that's an anthropological prayer that we pray for ourselves in order not to lose our focus on Ipsy. But through that prayer, we touch everything and everyone. Because ultimately, the prayer is a gift from the Holy Spirit. And so, as we form the cross of our existence, our relationship with God, if someone says, I love God, but I hate Ignatius, or I hate Mark, you know, that person is a hypocrite and a liar. And if someone says, I'm a humanist, and I love people, and I... I also love animals, and I, but I don't love God. I'm agnostic. He's a hypocrite. Okay, he's not a true person. And so, <clears throat> when Saint Emilio, Elder Emilio says, "True human being is the one being who knows how to pray," we also say, "True human being is the one who knows his God and knows and understands everyone around him." There cannot be God without us. There cannot be only us without God. They go together. And so this is something that, not now, but later on we'll talk because I don't want to take too much time. It's almost 8, uh, 10. The pizza is over there. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions, we can we can talk now. Because then we can... Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just thinking, Father Emiliano, so St. Emiliano's and Porfirio's, uh, that idea of loving your, your fellow man is just a reflection of what John said you know if you if you say you love your God but you don't love your brother then you're a liar yeah. so they're just amplifying what has been said by the apostles um, but it is true like we can talk about God we can say we know him yet if we're cruel to each other and we don't pray for each other we really are hypocrites so yeah. you know that's something to to really chew on because uh, yes. there's a lot of God talk but there's not a lot of God experience Yes, yes, and this this is why you know the the most uh, as Saint Anthony the Great says the greatest miracle that we can witness in our life is not when we see visions, angels ascending, descending from heaven, or even if someone resurrects, even if I have the power to resurrect the dead, that's not the greatest miracle. The greatest miracle is to see your own sins. Why? Because then basically we're opening the spiritual mirror and see who we are, and then we can truly know ourselves. So starting to pray, that's why what happens to us when we pray, the first thing we notice, how filthy we are, how disgusting we are, how impatient we are, how guilty we are about a lot of things. Because sometimes even during prayer, we'll, things will come to you and say, huh, I, I actually sent my brother when I didn't listen to him until the end what he was trying to say to me. And then I, I said something I was not supposed, something will come. Of course, we need to be careful because the logism can attack us even then. Prayer, but prayer is a, is a profound experience that cannot be called other way than, than the words mystical experience. If it's not that, then it's not true prayer. The Holy Spirit is the one who later on visits us and he comes. I forgot to mention this example when I was mentioning St. Porfirius, you know, St. Uh, Seraphim of Sarov. There was this moment when uh, one professor of physics, a good friend of Elder Paisius at the time, now St. Paisius, had an opportunity to take him from Uranopoli, I think, uh, from Mount Tatos, to bring him back to, uh, to Thessaloniki, to uh, for some appointment, doesn't matter. And it's a maybe an hour and a half, two hours drive. And so he said, because I had this privilege to be with the Elder by myself, he said, I'm going to, and he's, there is also him on YouTube talking about this, he's Greek. He says, I took on purpose the longest route to get to him so I can have more time with him. And, uh, and we went to a beautiful area, 
And as soon as we got out of the, of, of the populated area, I turned towards him and I saw he was praying, but I, you know, dared to ask him. I said, get on the, what is God like? And he said, he looked at me, he bowed down his, you know, his head, like he would pray. And I said, he doesn't say anything, you know, maybe, maybe he doesn't want to talk now. But since that was my holding the steering wheel, immediately everything started to change. I started feeling the nature. I started feeling that every leaf that drops from the trees is with the purpose and the blessing of the Lord, that nothing happens in the universe without giving thanks to Him, it, without being orchestrated and blessed by Him. He started seeing the stars glorifying God in that drive in His car, without even speaking words with Elder Pacius. Of course, what I'm describing you now, you can listen to yourself. He's talking about this experience. But he said, starting to basically feel everything in a way that it's only possible within the Spirit, within the Holy Spirit. And the, the original question was, post in Elthos. Elopecia said nothing. And it says, uh, as we went closer and closer to our destination, this, this feeling, this kind of trip, this, this understanding of everything started to dissipate, to kind of withdraw. And then I came back to myself. Without losing himself, without losing conscious, he was not on ayahuasca trip or, or taking something, uh, some drugs. He was on, on God. And this is a similar experience, of course, not the same, what Motovilov had with Saint Seraphim when he saw changing his face. He saw that just like when, the, uh, when we read on the, on the Feast of Transfiguration, we see Christ transfigured on the mountain, and this is how we chant. And St. Peter, John, and James, they see him transfigured. But the question the Holy Father said, that's not correct. Christ never transfigured himself. Christ was, Christ was always like that. It was the eyes of the apostles who were open to see him who, 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 who truly was, who he was as in reality. And this is why we are blinded by the distractions of this world, by our biological limitations, and above all by our sinfulness, that everything that we see and experience in the world is very primitive. This is why we have temptation to call ourselves monkeys, to call ourselves animals, because we, indeed we behave like them, and we justify and rationalize that behavior when we know that we are created for much more. And so this is why... Being anthropos means someone who looks towards eternity and is fixated. We're detested to eternity. Whether you believe in that or not, doesn't matter. Nobody cares about our feelings or about uh, our, our opinions and rationalizations. But about what, what impo what's important is how we approach uh, our, our God and how we approach ourselves. That determines our, our crucifixion. That determines our eternity. Amen. Any questions, guys? Yeah, we'll talk in detail about, God willing, about prayer. Uh, as I said, St. Theophon, <coughs> the recluse, but we want to finish with, <coughs> with this part of the text of Elder Yerman. And those, <coughs> we're not going to be able to finish everything. These are important topics. But I just want you to know that <coughs> prayer is essentially important, very important thing. If we don't pray, we cannot even rightfully, as Elder Yerman points out, call ourselves human beings. <coughs> human beings are... If we want to be anthropy or anthropos, uh, if we want to be humans, we, didn't, we need to be in relationship with God. The only way we achieve that is through prayer. And prayer is not a <clears throat> mechanical repetition of words. It's not us just opening the prayer book and pray. Because even if, I, even if I open the prayer book, I can be very negligent in how I pray. I can say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be the name of the kingdom of God, just to finish the prayer. Prayer is when we have a constant remembrance of God in everything that we do. And some, very often prayer can be without words, without saying anything. That's why uh, we need to listen to the Holy Fathers who have been through this experience and can help us to, uh, to ourselves to kind of steer up towards uh, their correct destination. Okay, if there is no questions, we can say the prayer and uh, we'll try to get something to eat. <clears throat> Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, both now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and save us. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Amen.